We're in a series, and this is part three, and it's called Daring to Do is Stanley Dale. And what's interesting is we haven't really talked much about Stanley Dale. Who in the world is this guy? So Stanley Dale is one of my favorite missionaries. Uh, he is, and we're going to get to Stanley Dale, but Stanley Dale is symbolic throughout this series because really we're, we're covering a period of time uh, which, you know, I could say 25 years, but it's a little more if we talk about the explosion of gospel impact in the island of Irian Jaya, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, this is such a powerful emblem to me of the work of grace of God in the last 100 years. And, you know, oftentimes we look back at the, the New Testament and we say, oh, if only we had such a movement of God in our world today. It's like, well, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about what God did, but he did it in such a weird spot of the world where, I mean, who cares about Papua New Guinea? God does, and that's what's so profound about this. This is a people group that for all practical purposes, you could say, just, just destroy them, God. Just bring judgment on them. Instead, God is going to show a great mercy upon them, and he is going to bring the gospel to them, and such a high percentage of them are actually going to repent and believe that it should shame all of us. It is remarkable, and then the missionary movement that is going to flow out of this is equally remarkable. Stanley Dale is a piece of that, just a piece, but he symbolizes something because he's sort of the rough-hewn sort of man where he's not that polished and he's not really probably even that good at what he was doing, but he was uniquely designed and crafted by God to do it. Even though his work was Im imperfect, what God did through this man changed the world. And I think that is heartening to all of us that feel like, you know, when you study the greats of Christian history, it's like, oh, if only I could behave like this, if only I could do this, if only I had the, the vigor and the work ethic of this, and oh, if I just had the mind of this person. But to recognize you are who you are. God designed you uniquely like a puzzle piece to fit into the grand story. And so when you try and be someone you're not, it just doesn't work. But when you allow God to fully maximize who you are, you become a Stanley Dale in the story. And it's a pretty exciting story that God has written for us to participate in. Part three, inured for danger. So, okay, guys, we need a vocabulary lesson to start out. Now, those of you that are Ellerslie students know my goal isn't to just impress you with big words, even though every now and then I try to, right? Uh, but it's, I want you to know the important vocabulary words that really help. And this is, a, this is a great vocabulary word, okay, inured. Most people don't know what it is or what it means, but if you could grasp it, it really bodes well for your soul because it's an important part of what the Holy Spirit does in our life. And it's a little scary when you look at that title, Inured for Danger. I don't, I don't know if I really want to have anything to do with danger. Don't even stick me, my name, and danger in the same sentence. I want to be as far away from that as possible. And yet, as Christians, we are being invited into a dangerous life. That's why we have a tendency to hesitate. It's like it, it, some people would say, Eric, don't tell them that. Don't let them actually know that it's dangerous and it's difficult and it's a narrow way. By the way, you know what narrow what means? A way of difficulty and compression. <laughs> That's what it means. Fewer are those who find it. And I always like to add on, fewer are those who want to find it. Who wants to go that way? The broad way is so much nicer. Look at that broad way. A narrow way? I don't want the narrow way. You do want the narrow way. The narrow way leads to life. And so as a result, we need to be built for a narrow way. We are being called to walk a narrow way. It's a greater challenge, yes, but there's greater grace for that. And some of you who don't fully understand the value of grace don't see that it is a good swap. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you just said it's more challenging. No, no, I said there's more grace. And you said, yeah, but I heard you say it's more challenging. I said, yeah, but the way I look at challenge is I get more grace. So as a result, I think this is a better deal. You see, you have to be convinced in the value of grace to really understand what I just said there. Jackie Pollinger, who you know, spent this, a good portion of her life in the walled city of Hong Kong, where even the police wouldn't go, she comes back to the United States 
and you know, almost every night she had 20 women in her, in her own bedroom, which is just a little small box, uh, and you know, some were on her bed, and they were coming off of heroin, and she came back to the United States and says, you may have your own room or your own bed. I know God's grace. And I remember thinking, what? Why does it sound like she has something better than I have? Because having my own bed and sounds a lot nicer than what she has. But she has a smirk on her face. She knows something I don't. See, we have access to the grace of God. We need to be inured for danger. So let's go into this. Inured. This is what inured means. To be seasoned, toughened, or prepared for something. I like it. Now, you could have said, why don't you just call this message prepared for danger? Well, I could have. But you always think of, you know, packing your backpack when I say that. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to be prepared to go on this camping trip. And so you're thinking of just what you bring along, when in actuality, this is an internal preparation. This is what God needs to do inside of us so that when we arrive at difficulty, when we arrive at suffering, when we arrive at the challenge, we are ready for it. In actuality, we thrive in the difficulty. Okay, now, if any of you ever went through a school system, because, you know, some of you are homeschooled, which does change the way you approach tests. But if any of you were in, like, a school system, whether it's a Christian school or a public school or a collegiate uh, system, and you have a test, maybe the next day or in a couple days, and if you're not prepared for the test, you hate tests. Okay, if you're not ready for that test, Tests are miserable. They're a form of torment. But if you are ready for the test, what do you want? You want the test. Isn't that weird? Have you ever had it where you're really getting good at something and you know it, and you're like, could you test me on this? You know, you have your flashcards. Quiz me on the flashcards. And what you want is to prove to that person and to yourself that you know it. And you want them to say, wow, you really know it. I, I do. I do. And so what do you want? Now you want to show the teacher that you know it. So it's like, come on, give me the test. Give me the test. What I just described for you is Christianity, when you're inured. When you are prepared by the Spirit of God, you actually wait and lean forward and say, God, when is the next test? When can I show what I have learned? When can I put into practice and exercise this joy that I have? I'm ready. And usually the test is a little more challenging than you thought. But also, God will give you precisely what you need to have victory in it. So I, this is the quote where I first was uh, learning the word inured, and it's R.M. Ballantyne. I don't know if any of you have ever read R.M. Ballantyne, but he was sort of like the author for boys. Was, it was like the way he was described. And uh, he was like the inspiration for Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote uh, Treasure Island. At this guy's memorial service, there were like 100,000 boys that showed up to mourn his passing because he was like the voice to them. He trained them in manhood and gave them a vision for how they should live their life as grand adventurers. All right, so this is uh, from his book, Gorilla Hunters. Listen to this statement. This is really funny. This is like a mom's worst nightmare, uh, that, that her boys would read this statement. Boys should be inured from childhood to trifling risks and slight dangers of every possible description, such as tumbling into ponds and off of trees, etc., in order to strengthen their nervous system. They ought to practice leaping off heights into deep water. They ought never to decline to climb up a tree, to pull fruit merely because there is a possibility of their falling off and breaking their necks. I firmly believe that boys were intended to encounter all kinds of risks in order to prepare them to meet and grapple with risks and dangers incident to man's career with cool, cautious self-possession. That is a really cool quote. And as a man, there's like this strange attraction to it. You know, it's a little, little intimidating, especially if you didn't grow up that way. But it's like we were designed as men to do difficult things, to do hard things, to take extreme risks, to stand in front of flying bullets, to defend those that the bullet was aimed at, to push people out of the way of oncoming cars and possibly get hit by the car. In other words, how do you train for such a life? A life of rescue, a life of self-sacrifice. How do you train for that? And that's what R.M. Valentine is talking about. Hey, a boy has to begin to practice this. He has to learn to take smaller risks so that he is prepared 
to take bigger risks. If he never takes a risk in his life, well, then when it comes to the point of the, the bullet flying, he's definitely not going to stand in front of it. When he sees the car coming down the street and the person needs to be pushed out of the way, he's not going to be conditioned or inured for that danger. And as a result, he will do nothing. So I'm going to take that same quote, shorten it down, and I'm going to take out the words trifling and slight, and I'm going to put in our definition for inured so that we really feel smart as we read this. Boys should be inured, seasoned, toughened, or prepared from childhood to risks and dangers of every possible description. Now, that's not a, the most typical quote you would ever hear in the Church of Jesus Christ right there, and yet there it is just sort of hanging out on the screen right now. And I actually like it. You see, it's the opposite of the way I was raised. I was raised in suburbia, USA, and everything was basically easy, okay? You don't take risks. You don't do anything unnecessary. You definitely don't climb out on the branch that could snap. You stay as far away from that branch as possible. And that's human wisdom. What we are being built for, when you start studying the unreached and you start, start studying what Stanley Dale is going to do, you recognize what builds a Stanley Dale. What causes someone to be willing to lay down their life, to give up their life, to go where no human would rightfully go to reach the souls of those that otherwise would never hear it? It's going to take something more than the prepackaged plan for suburban boys. If you want to see this world reached for Christ, there has to be a step outside of comfort zones into a different sort of territory, but not the one that is ruled by fleshly instinct and just the desire for adventure, you know, the bungee jumping fascination. There's something else that I want to circle and, and begin to focus on. It's spirit territory. It's, it's what the Holy Spirit desires to do in us. So here's a, a different sort of quote for you. I'm just, I, I gave the quotation as it being from the Bible. Okay, just listen to this. Christians, which includes all of us now, not just boys, should be inured, seasoned, toughened, or prepared from new birth to risks and dangers of every possible description. You know that most Christians throughout the ages, if you're going to believe in Jesus, you're basically signing your death warrant. You're basically saying, yeah, I'm ready to die. If you're in a Muslim country and you say, I'm going to be baptized, could someone baptize me? If, if your family finds out about that, I mean, this could go bad and quick. And yet, to make such a declaration is to, in a sense, from you, your new birth, be inured and be seasoned and toughened to say, I know what it costs. I understand the cost. I understand the risks. He is worth it. Do we understand the cost? Do we understand the risks? Do we believe that he is worth it? See, we've been able to live out our Christianity without cost. Now, some of us think that we're really facing extreme persecution right now in America, and I would say we are, in, we are facing an increasing level of persecution in America, but still we have not reached what the early church had to be inured for. But I believe God wants to inure us, see I'm using my word, to inure us for our calling. But we have to say, okay, God, Whatever it takes, I want you to begin to prepare me for what you know I am called to. If I'm going to be Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah, oftentimes referred to as uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if I'm going to be one of those three and I'm going to be asked to bow down before an uh, idol, you know, some kind of image of Nebuchadnezzar, otherwise I'm thrown into a furnace of fire, which way am I going to go? You see, I need to already have a preparation in my soul to be willing to stand when everyone else bows down. Whew, this is going to be hard because I can already feel the heat from that uh, furnace. And wow, to be thrown into a furnace of fire that even when you get close to it, you die. I mean, you remember those, those guys, they turned up the heat of it and even the ones that were throwing them in got torched and these guys survived. I mean, it's an incredible story. But are we ready to make such a decision? This is a decision that Christians throughout the ages have had to make. But are we ready?
for that decision. We can be made ready if we are desirous, if we are willing. God will make us ready to make the decisions that are required to showcase the glory of God in this realm. The Dark Mountain Kingdoms. So this is Dr. Robert Wick from his book, God's Invasion. New Guinea is located in the South Pacific, immediately north of Australia. It is 1,500 miles long and 400 miles wide at its broadest point. Superimposed on the United States, it would reach from Seattle, Washington to Kansas City, Missouri. Its width would reach from Chicago, Illinois to Nashville, Tennessee. The climate is humid, that's an understatement, with many parts of the island receiving 100 inches of rainfall a year. Some areas south of the Central Mountains receive as much as 300 inches of rain annually. That's like living in a shower. Crocodile snakes and unusual birds inhabit the extensive swamplands which nomadic tribes call home. From an airplane, the central interior of Irian Jaya appears as an endless jumble of sharp ridges, gigantic peaks, deep gorges, and narrow valleys at elevations from four to 8,000 feet. Myriads of trails wind through the interior, over ridges, across valleys, through swamp and jungle, on slippery knife-sharp rocks, and through rushing streams. It is not unusual for people to lose their lives on dangerous paths, in swollen streams, and in landslides. The interior highlands of Irian Jaya remained isolated and unknown to the outside world until the 20th century. While the rest of the world advanced in the age of the automobile, the airplane, and scientific technology, central Irian Jaya remained in the Stone Age. Enormous malarial swamplands made it all but impossible for even the best equipped expeditions to penetrate the edges of these dark mountain kingdoms. Now imagine if right before I read that, I said, by the way, you're going to be heading out next year. I mean, wouldn't that be a, a bit intimidating if you knew you were going to head out to that? You know, at this time in the 30s, the 1930s, this area is beginning to be explored. Not in the sense of like, all right, let's go out and backpack in. It's like flying over it. And like, how in the world are you going to get in there? It's like canyons, cliffs, swamps. It's like, how do you get in there? And so even the first expeditions are going to miserably fail, and people are going to die. They can't get in. They cannot figure out how to get into this territory. And so we're talking about danger of dangers, where you, anyone who's going to go on an exploration or an expedition, is what they called it, into the interior has to give up their life before they go. They basically have to say, I recognize I likely will not return. And ironically, the first people going, it's for the sake of adventure. It's like just to say they did it, which is like climbing Everest. It's like, why does someone do that? It's just to say they did it. And so ironically, now you bring in the Christian motive. It is discovered that there are tribes there. Someone's going to be flying over, uh, doing a scouting, uh, scouting for an oil company to find some place to drill, and they actually see huts. I'm like, whoa, there's people in here. And then that begins to transfer back to the missionaries, to the church of Jesus Christ. They're saying, if there are people in there, they need to hear the gospel. Well, who's dumb enough to go in there? And that's, of course, the story we're talking about. We're talking about all the people dumb enough to go in there, which hopefully by the end of this series includes all of us. In other words, that we, though we look foolish to the world, are the wisest in heaven's eyes. The ones that say, God, it would be my privilege. But Eric, you do know that you would likely lose your life. I know. But it's worth it. For you, Lord. And that's a whole different way of thinking. So we're talking about the dark mountain kingdoms. Well, in the dark mountain kingdoms, there are the dark mountain slaves. Interior Irian Jaya, in, uh, this is a quote from a guy named Eric Ludi, by the way. See that? We haven't had many quotes from Eric Ludi. This is fun to have one up. Interior Irian Jaya in 1938, a place where demons controlled, violence reigned, cannibalism was celebrated, treachery was deemed the highest virtue, women and children were commodities of exchange, revenge was carried on for generations, and the light of gospel truth had never even flickered its hopeful gleam in the understanding of the depraved people living there. This was life on, around, and near 
these dark mountain kingdoms. So that, it's not just the terrain that is treacherous. The people that live in this terrain will kill you if you make it to them. It's like you cannot create a greater hazard for humanity than what we have here in Irian Jaya. Again, should I ask the question, who is dumb enough to go? Well, and that's the symbol of Stanley Dale. Stanley Dale is like, let me go. And that's why it's daring to do as Stanley Dale. So Robert Wick continues, in light of this, would Western Christians be so hard-hearted as to leave these people in their continual pain, suffering, and cruel spirit bondage. Surely God had something far better for them. The Christian world had the answer if they would but pay the price of bringing Christ to these people, cringing in the dreadful darkness of satanic enslavement. Oh boy, that's a good quote. Inured for danger? What is needed for this to happen? So what is needed for us to be inured? What has to happen in our life? So Harper and Hudson got involved in something called parkour. I had never heard of parkour. Uh, it was just sort of this mysterious thing. Leslie came home. She says, yeah, I was just looking into this thing. I think it's French. Uh, and it's called parkour. And so I don't remember how I imagined it being spelled parkour. But I was thinking like core exercises and it's parkour. And as I, was, I couldn't figure out what it, she's talking, she's describing for me, it's like jumping over things, doing flips. It's like, what? Uh, and she, after she visited the thing, she goes, you would actually really like it. And so then I was like intrigued. So I, I went and Hudson and Harper were being trained uh, in this. And it was, it's extremely fascinating for however I'm wired, you know, to jump over things. And uh, who was it? Uh, Donovan, who when he goes under the, uh, the doorway there has to jump up and touch it. That's the same way I am. You know, anything above me has to be defeated somehow. I have to be able to touch it to say you're not high enough not to be defeated by me. And that's a typical guy thing. But the parkour is like made for that sort of mentality too. But long and short, if I could try and describe parkour, it's, it's originally a military training. Uh, and this is what the, mili the French military learned. And if... If I was trying to get to that double door in the back of the chapel, but I was doing it parkour style, I would not just go down the middle aisle. That is boring. No, I need to get there in the most creative and unique and challenging way possible. So in other words, as a parkour athlete, I look for challenge. I relish challenge. I don't want the easy way. Who made this hallway here? Come on. You take all the fun out of it when you make a little hallway like this. I want to jump over a chair, land on the edge of one of the chairs, jump up, go on the string of lights, flip up onto the beam, maybe do a double you know, flip onto the next beam. I'm going to make my way there, but I'm going to risk my life in doing it. <laughs> Welcome to parkour. Okay, and these guys love it. Okay, these, if you've ever seen a parkour video, I mean, it really, it makes you laugh. And it's really pretty cool to watch. But these people are taking everyday movements and making them extra hard. Okay, you could just go up that stairwell. You don't need to flip over the side, hang on the side of the, you know, five stories up, and then flip down. And it's like, what are you doing? You're risking your life. Like, I know. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to say. Christianity is the real version of parkour. Parkour is a fake of what is very real. You see, God designed us to delight in the challenge of following him with the same vigor and fervor that a parkour athlete has in trying to make it to the back of the room in their creative, fun, challenging way. So the parkour mindset is this, flipping obstacles and trials on their head. You see, to a parkour athlete, a trial and an obstacle is an opportunity. It's something to smirk at and even laugh at and look at your buddy and go, oh, yeah, this is going to be good. How many of us as Christians say that when we face a trial or an obstacle? You see, we should be the expert parkour athletes. Instead, I mean, even the Bible teaches us, says, hey, you're supposed to approach that like a parkour athlete. And we're like, what's that? 
I don't understand. And then finally parkour comes out, and they're like, oh, it's like that. Yeah, why are they doing it and we're not? That doesn't make any sense. So here's some uh, illustrations of it. So this guy runs into a brick wall. Now, when you run into a brick wall in your life, in your spiritual life, do you do this? This guy is looking for a brick wall. And when he finds the brick wall, he does a little flip on it. So how about this? Every brick wall is an opportunity to do a cool flip. Every impassable canyon, now I know that doesn't look like an impassable canyon, but hey, you know, at least gives you the idea, is an opportunity to do a leap, to do a leap like a superhero. You see, when a parkour athlete sees a canyon, they don't go, oh, great, like we do. They go, oh, yeah, and then they risk their life to leap over it. And every passage of suffering is an opportunity to do as Christians do. I always look at this picture and I say, there's the church of Jesus Christ right there. That's what we look like. You see, we are tackling all of life's challenges and we're doing it with a smile and a laugh. This is what we are built for. We are inured for this. We are trained by the Spirit of God to take walls and flip, to take canyons and leap to take trials and rejoice. It's called leaping for joy. So, I think it's high time that we awaken to the amazing privilege that we have to live life happier than anyone else on earth. So what is the Christian mindset? When we find an obstacle, we shout for joy and immediately transform the overcoming of that obstacle into a great adventure challenge. The doctrine of spiritual sport, you know, somewhat of an odd, strange statement. When we think of Christianity, we don't think of it being a sport. And, you know, Paul himself is going to talk about running a race. He's going to talk about an athlete when he is training. You know, he uses the, the phraseology of sports. And in a sense, if you were to use those glasses and put them on as you approach Christianity, it does help in understanding what the leap for joy is. God commands us to flip our difficulties on their back and pin them to the mat and force them to cry out, I'm sorry I ever messed with you. The essence of the heart-mind attitude of the Christian is that of an athlete vigorously engaged in the arena before a great audience of witness. Isn't it a fun thought to think of this being like some great parkour challenge? We're like, all right, all right. And God's like, I have a unique commission for you, a unique calling. All right, it's going to have some streams to jump over, some malarial swamps to go around, some sharp, jagged uh, cliffs, and some cannibals. All right, go! And you're like, all right, all right, all right, let's go. Ah, let's go, let's go, let's go. One of my favorite stories is, who's, my, who's the guy? Uh, oh, I'm trying, after Polycarp, uh, he, he ran to the beasts. I cannot think of his name all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, Nathan can't help me either. Hudson, do you remember? Germanicus, there we go. So Germanicus, I mean, mo most of us when we're getting fed to wild beasts are not too excited. You know, it's just, it's, we're thinking about what that's going to feel like, and that's not going to feel very good. Germanicus enters the arena with a smile and like a shout and sprints towards the beasts. Uh, okay, guys, you see something there you're attracted to? That's pretty special. Imagine the onlooking crowd going, what is that? That's what they should be saying when they see us face our trials. You see, they don't face their trials like we face ours. When they have financial difficulty, they moan and they complain and they go into anxiety mode. When they have trauma in health, when they have any difficulty in life, what do they do? They turn inward. They self-preserve. What does a Christian do? Turns outward, gives up their life, rejoices, shouts, leaps. Watch what my God will do with this. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 8. So in all of these upcoming, I think it's like four scriptures, you're going to see that I'm going to create a dynamic with each of these scriptures. The scriptures are still accurate. I'm just going to rearrange how they're stated. We are grieved by many trials. Okay, so when we are grieved by many trials, what is our typical response? Oh, boy, this stinks. And yet, what is the scriptural pattern? And yet, we greatly rejoice. We rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 
That is flipping a trial. That is taking a brick wall and flipping off of it. That is taking a canyon and leaping over it. How about Matthew 5? We are reviled, persecuted, and falsely accused. Okay, imagine if that's all we had in the scripture, is that little statement right there. Talk about a reason to complain, moan, and groan. And yet, blessed are we, let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. 1 Peter 4, we are partakers of Christ's sufferings, and yet we may be glad with exceeding joy. That's not just we may be glad with joy. It's like this abundant joy that just overflows, like the little Dixie cup under Niagara Falls. It's exceeding amounts of water coming into that little cup. 1 Peter 4, we, en- we enduring tribulations, and yet we are exceeding joyful. We face trials and testings, and yet we count it all joy. Do you see a pattern here? The doctrine of spiritual sport, that the way we appropriate the difficulties and the challenges of life is very different than the world around us. So the spiritual sport of IFD, so if we were going to name, you know, what we do as Christians, you know, it could be called IFD, you know, inured for danger, right? Uh, Some call it LAD, maybe they even call it LAD, I'm not sure, laughing at difficulty, both made up terms by the way, if you're wondering where I got those from, but this is what the game is, we flip trials, we run circles around tribulation, we pin difficulties to the mat, we springboard off of pain and we leverage every challenge, that's the sport we play, and we should be very good at it. There's no reason why we shouldn't because we have the ultimate coach. The Holy Spirit says, look, I'll whip you into shape. You ready to come to practice? I'll train you. I'll train you to be the greatest athlete this world has ever seen. Just a lot of my students don't show up in the gym every day. You see, we have the ultimate trainer if we will submit to him and allow him to endure us. He will. And as a result, when we face those rocky, jagged cliffs, when we face those, uh, those swamps full of malaria, when we face the head-hunting tribes, we smile because we know what to do with them. We know exactly how to handle that challenge. If you have never lifted a weight in your life and then suddenly you get a big heavy weight, that's pretty intense. That's pretty intimidating. But if you've been lifting weights your entire life and you get that same heavy weight, it's probably lighter than what you normally carry. And so as a result, you don't get intimidated by it. In fact, you, you know, you do a few movements with it just to show the devil that it's not that big of a deal. You got anything else out there? All we have is some malaria, some sharp, jagged uh, uh, cliffs, and we have some headhunters? Is that all you got? Most of us aren't at that point yet, (laughs) but could you imagine the Spirit of God growing you up and training you for that? And if it was possible, wouldn't you want to sign up today? Welcome to Christianity. The shadow instinct to risk everything to do something crazy. You see, this idea of doing something crazy for the sense of adventure is deeply woven into the psyche of the human race. But it's a counterfeit of the real thing that is meant to be spirit-born. It's funny, the greatest risk-takers are often the non-Christians. And we always say, well, they have a death wish. That's what we say. And yet, the idea of risking and having a thrill in so doing is actually a very God thing. But it needs to be redeemed. It needs to be moved from this side of the ledger to this side of the ledger. So uh, I I went through a series called The Dangerous Game back in, I want to say January or February. And I I went through this. This is is a really funny little thought. But look at these things. These are things that people do and consider them fun. (laughs) Adventure camping. So this guy, if we could zoom in on his his face, has a huge smile on his face. He is on the bottom side of a cliff face, in a tent, hanging there, drinking his coffee, 
And I am so stressed out when I see that picture, trying to figure out how he gets out of that tent <laughs> in the morning. Okay, I mean, that's like so stressful. Yeah, this guy loves it. What is this? This is a shadow. This is a counterfeit version of risk and adventure that God desires to convert into his kingdom. He wants to use this. This fascination with danger, this fascination with risk is meant to be utilized for the glory of God. Look at this one. Free solo climbing. Okay. That is such an extreme picture. And I, don't, I mean, that's, there's no harness. There's no ropes. Just this guy's grip as he hangs over. I don't know how high he is, but it's way too high. <laughs> and yet, this guy is as happy as a lark. Isn't that just funny to think? He wouldn't be doing it if he didn't like it, Right? In fact, I guarantee you this isn't the first time. This isn't his first rodeo. He's been doing this for a long time if he's doing that, right? And why does he keep doing it? That's what people would say about us. Why do you keep doing that? Do you notice that they spit on you? They slap you in the face? They reject you? Why do you keep sharing the gospel with people? Oh, boy, this is fun. This is good. This is what I'm built for. You see, we're supposed to be the adventure campers, the free solo climbers. We're Christians. How about this one? or this very sensible act. So this guy, uh, I did a little research into the story. I guess he's just gotten engaged, so his fiance is taking the picture. And this is, <laughs> this is his first celebratory act, is to go upside down off a cliff and hang by his feet. And all I can think when I see it is, how in the world does he get back up? <laughs> that is so stressful. <laughs> And yet this guy's loving it. This is his celebratory maneuver. Could you imagine your celebratory mover is go, you know, you get engaged and you're like, okay, let's go talk to a cannibal about Jesus. See, we, when we celebrate, when we get excited, when we want to do what brings us to life, we give Jesus. At least that's the way it always has been. That's the church triumphant. See, this is the greatest pleasure. This is the greatest thrill is to be in the service of Jesus Christ. The Shackleton Invite, the strange firstborn shadow instinct towards the game. So this is a famous story, and that is that Ernest Shackleton, who was the grand explorer, where he had this, this instinct for adventure and danger, but he leveraged it towards well, self-glory and towards that self-desire for adventure. It had no redeeming value, even though I really love the story. If you've ever read Endurance, the story is really good. Uh, but listen to this. This comes from uh, Carl Elmer Hopkins in the book, Quit Ye Like Men. Sir Ernest Shackleton, when he was about to set out on one of his expeditions, printed a statement in the papers to this effect. Men wanted for hazardous journey to the South Pole. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. In speaking of it afterward, he said that so overwhelming was the response to his appeal that it seemed as though all the men of Great Britain were determined to accompany him. Isn't that amazing? You see, there's something in us that wants an adventure. And Jesus is saying, uh, could I have that? Now, some of us spend our adventure in video game land. It's like, oh, I'm living it. I'm living it. I'm living it. Some of us, it's through movies. Oh, boy, I just felt like I lived it tonight. Boy, that movie just took me on a ride. And it's a replacement for an actual adventure. We're living in la-la land. God designed us to be in his movie, to be leading characters in his storyline. But we have to extricate ourselves from the false version so that we could enter into what God intended the Redeemed Risk Takers, December 1938, the first missionary journey to the interior. So that uh, man, uh, his Lieutenant Colonel Whistle, is going to be flying over uh, Papua New Guinea, and he is going to see these three massive lakes right in the middle of the mountainous zone. And so they're known as the Whistle Lakes. And so around these Whistle Lakes was a whole bunch of tribes, but they were unreached. No one had ever been to them. And so as a result, multiple 
expeditions are going to go in. The first one is going to be unsuccessful. Multiple people are going to die. A few people are going to make it back with, you know, a, sc a scrap of their lives left. Same guy is like, I have to go. And he's going to go out the next time, still lose lives, barely make it, but he's going to make it to the Whistle Lakes. No Christian intent, just blazing a trail. So now there is sort of a concept of a trail there. Meanwhile, Robert Jaffrey, if you guys remember R.A. Jaffrey and me talking about him in a previous episode, he was the one influenced by A.B. Simpson. R.A. Jaffrey is over this territory of, of the world for the Christian and Missionary Alliance and their entire missionary mandate. And his close friend, his right-hand man, is a man named Russell Dibler. And Russell Dibler is going to marry a lady named Darlene. Darlene Dibler, Rose, is what because she's going to have a second marriage after, I don't want to spoiler alert, Russell dies, okay? But the story is good. It is a very powerful story. And uh, that, that is captured in the book Evidence Not Seen by Darlene Dibler Rose. And I highly recommend it. Almost every biography written about this island are some of the best biographies out of all the history of Christian biographies. I don't know how that could be, but if you take Don Richardson's book, Peace Child and Lords of the Earth, and you take Darlene Dibler Rose's book, Evidence Not Seen, those are literally three, probably of my top 10 biographies ever. And that's amazing, because it's one little part of the world, and yet it is so moving, so stirring. So in December of 1938, a man named Russell Dibler is going to arrive in Papua New Guinea, and he is going to take up the challenge. He's going to say, I want to go. I want to make it to the Whistle Lakes. Well, you do know that you likely won't make it alive. Someone needs to bring the gospel to these people. We need to make a trail for other Christians to get in. I'll go. I mean, this is like craziness. He's a newly married man. He has so much to lose. He's young. He has a future. But to him, his future belongs to Jesus. So there is a picture of Russell. This is what Russell said. At times, it was almost a perpendicular climb, and often we had to resort to the use of a crude ladder. There were sharp stones on the trail which cut one's boots to shreds, boulders which, if set in motion, would destroy everything in their path, and precipices which made one shudder to look over them. This is a letter he's going to write to his wife, Darlene. I often thought I'd never reach the lakes, but I was determined to make it or die in the attempt. Isn't that interesting that he would acknowledge that to his wife? It's like, I was determined to make it, but then I thought about you. And I thought, no, it is better that I live a long life with my wife than that I make it to the Whistle Lakes. Instead, he said, I was willing to die in the attempt. And then she boasts about it and shares it. She's like, I'm proud of my husband. Why? Because his motive wasn't just for adventure. He knew that those people had to be reached with the gospel. They had lived in darkness for long enough. They had never been exposed to the truth. They were being controlled by Satan, and Jesus purchased them with his blood. They must hear the gospel. Whew. God built us to be tried and have serious fun while in his service. So let me give you a motto. Secondborns have more fun. I, I just happen to be a secondborn, so I, I like that. Uh, but I'm the firstborn male in our home, uh, but I'm second. My, I have an older sister, right? And so I like the idea of the secondborn. Remember, I'm always saying seconds, you know, first and seconds. And the seconds are, firsts are, are the ones that God can't accept, you know, like Cain's offering. But Abel's offering, the second is the one he accepts. Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob. It's always the second that has God's favor. Saul, David. David is the man after God's own heart, even the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so the secondborns, unless you be born again, unless you become a secondborn, unless you are born again in Christ, you can't truly live. We are not to function as firstborns. Firstborns ought not to have more fun than the secondborns. You see, the world out there that is living for self, living for comfort, living for pleasure, actually has nothing on us, the secondborns. We have access to the throne room of grace. 
At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We have access to unlimited amounts of joy and peace. We have unlimited amounts of love available to us. We have access to God. We are adopted as his children. We are given everything we need for life and godliness so that we can triumph in every difficulty. Come on, guys. We're the ones that should be smiling bigger than anyone else in this world. We're the ones that should be laughing more. Why? Because there is victory and we know it. We have a reason to rejoice. Everyone else has to contrive one. They don't know why they can be happy. So they have to live in a magical world of falseness. We have truth that sets us free. Key phrase, taking it patiently. So this is a biblical phrase. And here's how I'm going to define this biblical phrase, and then I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. Taking it patiently. See, when we hear the idea of patience, we think of, you know, someone standing in front of a microwave with popping popcorn and not complaining. Okay, no, no, it's okay. It's okay that it's taking a little long to finish popping that last kernel. Or when you're at church growing up and your mom is a talker, and she's always the last one out, and so you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and then that's patience, okay, to not squabble, to not make a noise, to, to not, you know, hang on your mom's arm, which is what I used to do, uh, and go, come on, can we go, can we go, be patient. See, for us, patience is a little kid thing. You know what patience is historically in the church? It is what martyrs need. You know the way a martyr goes through the martyrdom? The way they give up their life and die, even very painful deaths, is through patience. Isn't that interesting? Patience is the ability to go through difficulty with triumph. It's the ability to endure long without snapping, without breaking, without losing your form. That's incredible. And so when the commission is coming to take it patiently, all right, you have a challenge, let's take it patiently. Well, how do we as Christians, how can we look at that? We're gamifying the challenge. We're walking through difficulty as if it were a sport. We're smiling at dangers as if they are a thrill, and we're recognizing hardships as the ultimate fun. If you have this mentality, the devil is really going to be disturbed by you, because no matter what he brings, you laugh. He throws you in a prison cell, and you sing. He beats you with rods, and you come out rejoicing. Ah! Ah! That has to be frustrating. He's working his best against you, and everything he does gets turned to good in your life. You get stronger. Boy, that has to be frustrating. Then when he finally kills you, your death becomes the reason that all these other people believe, and they become just like you. Boy, that's frustrating. It's Christianity, and it is intended to really frustrate the devil. So here's our scripture in 1 Peter 2. For this is commendable, if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps." So let's amplify this little phrase here in 1 Peter 2.20. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, if you gamify the challenge, you walk through the difficulty as if it were a sport, you smile at the dangers as if they were a thrill and recognize the hardships as the ultimate fun, this is commendable before God. Isn't that a fun mentality to have? So what, what I'm going to be building on throughout this uh, is what I'm going to call Stanley Dale prayers. So each one of these episodes that I have, I want to sort of derive a prayer out of it. And so by the end, I don't know if this is going to be a 20-part series, a 21-part series, or a 22-part series. It's going to be somewhere in that range. But you'll see that I have three prayers so far because this is the third episode. So the first one, which goes with the legend maker, the first episode, is Lord prepare me for the heavenly call. And the, remember, the premise of that one was we all have a calling. We all have a mission field. The question is, do we want to see it? Do we really want to walk in what God has called us to? So Lord, prepare me for the heavenly call. 
The second one, which was the message passing on the Kasu Marzu, remember how delightful and delectable Kasu Marzu was? Lord, refine my taste buds for all heavenly delicacies. I want to have new taste buds so that I appropriate what you are calling me to and I actually want it. I consider it tasty as opposed to, oh, yuck, that sounds horrible. Sharp, razor-like ridges, you know, uh, malarial-filled swamps and headhunters. Oh, that's horrible, as opposed to Stanley Dale. Sign me up. That sounds great. That's the ultimate thrill sport for Stanley Dale. You see, we have to be inured, which comes to the third message. Lord, season me, toughen me, and prepare me for all difficulty. Holy Spirit, become my trainer. Do what you need to do to ready me for the calling that you've given me. To me, this is just thrilling. I don't know if you guys are as thrilled as I am. But this, to me, is exciting Christianity. All right, in each one of the messages, I've, I've finished with this, which is the missionary motto of Stanley Dale. Now, just as a reminder, Stanley Dale didn't actually write this. This is the summation of him as a symbolic character, sort of the summation of the whole series. Going enthusiastically, sharing courageously, serving sacrificially, suffering joyfully, dying triumphantly. Let's let the Holy Spirit do that in us. Father, we ask that you would build us into spiritual athletes for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord, we have obstacles in our soul, places of reticence, places of fear and anxiety, and I pray that you would touch them and remove them out of the way. Solve our dilemmas of soul so that we could live fully for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus.